So Chebyshev tried very hard to prove the prime number theorem. The prime number theorem was a conjecture of Gauss. Says that limit x goes to infinity of pi of x divided by x over log x equals 1. <coughs> That's what he, that's the conjecture. Now Chebyshev, um, is because he tried very hard to prove this theorem, he was trying to refine the constants in a successive succession of papers. He was trying to show better and better constants. He was getting awfully close to one, but he wasn't quite there. And uh, he managed to show using this particular fact here that, um, um, if, so Chebyshev showed, if limit exists, then it, it equals 1, <coughs> the limit is 1. So he managed to get very close, but not right there yet. Hmm? And how would you do this? How did he do this? Well, as I mentioned last time, <coughs> the study of pi of x, the prime counting function, um, is a little difficult to do because of its raggedy nature of counting. Every time you hit a prime, you put 1. Otherwise, you put 0. It's a little raggedy. Okay, So it's better to perhaps wait um, primes by log p and try to count those. So what he fo first showed was using using Abel's lemma or using partial summation Chebyshev showed that <coughs> the study of pi of x um, pi of x being asymptotic to x over log x is completely equivalent to saying theta of x is asymptotic to x, which is completely equivalent to saying psi of x is asymptotic to x. Where, what are these functions? Where theta of x is log p, p less than x, where that means I'm summing over primes and I'm weighting each prime by log p. And psi of x equals n less than x lambda of n, where lambda of n is this one mongol function. And what this, what's the difference between this and this? Well, this includes prime powers and this doesn't. But the prime powers count for very little with respect to x, of course. So they can, their, their contribution to the sum is small. And therefore, um, the whole business of trying to prove that the prime numbers behave this asymptotic law is completely equivalent to proving this asymptotic law, which is completely equivalent to proving this asymptotic law. So in other words, if I'm trying to show that this limit exists, that's equivalent to showing this limit exists. OK, so we will, or this limit exists. So we will now look at this equivalence. So let's try to show if the limit exists, the limit is 1. Suppose, so what I'm trying to say is, suppose, let's prove the following theorem. <coughs> so suppose, and this is probably a good exercise in how analytic number theory works, so I'll do a little bit of it. So suppose limit x goes to infinity, theta of x over x exists, okay? Then the limit is 1. Then alpha equals 1. <coughs> Last time I introduced the big O notation, which was very convenient for calculations. Hmm? 
This time I'm going to use, uh, introduce little o notation. So we say, uh, it's very convenient to use it, we say f of x equals little o of g of x. I put a dash under the o because sometimes people make o's big and then that would be confusing, right? So when I put a little dash, at least I'm, I know I'm talking about little o. Uh, so we say this if limit x goes to infinity f of x over g of x is 0 as x goes to infinity. Yeah. Okay, so let's, so for example, we have, <coughs> um, <coughs> we have, um, well, we have log x is equal to little o of x, right? Because log x by x goes to 0 as x goes to infinity, etc. Now, we can express this limit here in terms of the little o notation. What this says, star, star says that theta x equals alpha x plus little o of x. Because when I divide by x, theta of x divided by x is equal to alpha plus little o 1. What is something little o 1? It goes to 0. That's what little o 1 means, okay? So that's another way of convenient way of rewriting a limit as an equation. So you can see the power of the symbol. Again, I told you the power of symbology in mathematics and probably in life is that it's a very powerful psychological, uh, um, you know, uh, factor in, in, in thought, in human thought. So, okay, we have this. Now let's look at this equation here, this, um, let's call this double star. Let's look at that equation. So, um, double star by obels, by partial summation we can rewrite this thing as <coughs> keeping in mind that I'm going to use my sequence to be log p and my function f of t to be 1 over t. Hmm? So that would be theta of x divided by x minus the integral from 1 to x theta of t over, well the derivative of 1 over t that's plus t squared dt, right? So I rewrite it using the partial summation technique. That gives me one more relation. See, on one hand, I know that it's equal to log x plus big O of 1. On the other hand, I have my connection to the, the theta function here, and I'm going to try and exploit that. Now, remember that we already showed last time that pi of x being O of x over log x is equivalent to theta of x being O of x. We've already shown that. So this guy here is O of 1. It's bounded. Okay? So at least this is now tallying here. Okay? This is a bounded quantity. So this is not going to do. So the main term of this thing is log x. So the main term really should be coming from here. Now I'd like to plug in theta of t is equal to alpha t plus little o of t into here, and let's just do this mentally for a second. If I plug in theta t to be alpha t plus little o of t, I would get alpha t plus little o of t divided by t squared. That would be alpha over t dt, and alpha over t dt integrates to alpha log x. Okay, so at least, so if that's the case, well, there's a log x there, therefore alpha better be 1. So that's kind of the proof, but there's something wrong with that proof. Look, something wrong is how you treated the little o factor. Okay, so it's not quite right to say that this is equal to the integral 1 to x alpha t plus little o of t. You should know how to use this little o symbol carefully. Remember what little o means. It means as x is going to infinity. So, there's a little bit of a problem in the initial ranges, right? So you really can do this. This little o of t uh, is only when the argument is going to infinity. 
So what you really should do, so l let me just finish this off. So this guy is equal to alpha log x and what looks like little o of log x. That's what it looks like. Hmm? Um, that's almost right, as I said, but this really should be split up into 1 to y and then y to x. And I'm gonna s just going to leave it to you to do at home. Okay? And y is what? y is going to be some parameter to be chosen later. And when you, so, so that y is going to be a certain function of x, which will tend to infinity. So on this part of the integral, you can use this little trick. Because the little o of t is OK, because that's little o of t as long as t is going to infinity, and all the arguments are going to infinity here. But on the initial part, you have to be, uh, you have to use the brute est uh, some sort of brute estimate, crude estimates, and, and, and get away with that. And, and there you would use the fact that theta of t is O of t, and therefore it's, it's O of t over t squared, but then you're going to get the O of log y. So this will give you something like O of log y, and this will give you alpha log x over y plus something small, so that's okay. And then if you ch it turns out that if you choose well, this is not the only choice, but if you choose y to be like e to the lo root log x, then the log y here will be um, <coughs> root log x. So this is y. Log y would be root log x. So that the contribution from the y factor is substantially smaller than log x. Since the main term on the left-hand side is log x, and the, the other term here is alpha log x, you then deduce alpha has to be 1. You did, okay, so this is a little, little bit of a trick uh, exercise in analytic number theory, which you should master in how to use the little o symbol. Okay? So, but, but that's the proof. That's the proof of Chebyshev's theorem that says if the limit exists, it has to be 1. So the whole business of the proof of the prime number theorem is now reduced to showing the existence of the limit. And you may wonder, how could that be so hard? And it is. That's, the, that's where the, the hard part is. So sometimes, you know, very simple things can be very difficult, uh, simple things stated can be very difficult to prove, right? So are there any questions about um, what I said so far? Hmm, looks okay? OK.